I would like to introduce our scripture today by reading a few verses just before the scripture passage that we're actually supposed to read. And I'm going to ask you a question first. Um, how many of you remember the story about Jesus calming the ocean and the wind and the waves? Just wave to me if you do. Okay, good. So that's where we're going to start. Jesus was in the storm. Actually, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. They were terrified. The disciples were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So they came to the other side of the lake, to the region of the Gerasenes. Just as Jesus was getting out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came from the tombs and met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For his hands and feet had often been bound with chains and shackles, but he had torn the chains apart and broken the shackles in pieces. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Each night and every day among the tombs and in the mountains, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. This is God's word to us, and I'm so thankful, Lord, that you give us, as we have just sung, hope for the hopeless and rest for the weary. Well, good morning, everybody. I asked Ken if I was going to be introduced, and Marlene says, no, you belong. So there we go. <laughs> it was good to see you again, and I am really pleased that this morning I have my wife, Mina, with me. She's sitting over there with the builders. Why don't you stand, babe, because they haven't all met you. It's my wife, Mina. And I'll probably be in trouble later for making her stand up, but that's all right. So some people said, well, we don't know how many people are going to be here. I said, welcome to summer in Manitoba. Just the way it is. People come, people go. And I mean, we only have such a short time of warm weather. We want to play while we can, right? Personally, I'm looking forward to fall, especially after this past week of extremely hot temperatures. <laughs> and uh, I always say I do really good with the heat as long as I can be in the shade or in the air conditioning. So it can be as hot out as it wants to. My wife, on the other hand, she's one of those who likes to be out on the beach and somebody come along with a spatula and flip her every once in a while. And she's really good out on the beach, but uh, not me, not me. So this morning, as was just read, we're looking in Mark chapter 5, familiar story. Jesus comes across after this horrendous experience out on the water. And uh, the first thing he meets is this, this guy running down the beach with no clothes on, screaming at the top of his lungs. And I mean, that's got to do your head a flip. I mean, it didn't bother Jesus. But I mean, let's look at this guy for just a second. I mean, it's obvious that this gentleman is having more than just a bad day, right? I mean, it's not like you get up in the middle of the night, stub your toe on the way to get a drink of water and wake up like this, Right. Or it's not like, you know, you're just having, you know, your car break down in the morning, you can't get to work or whatever, and you end up like this. I mean, this is something very, very serious here. And what we are seeing with this individual is the far end of an extended process. And, you know, the thing about this is this whole process began with one decision. Now here's something that you want to write down and never forget, and it's going to be on the PowerPoint there for you. 
the whole spiritual world operates on the power of agreement. You need to know that. It's very, very important. The whole spiritual world operates on the power of agreement. I want you to know that the devil cannot do anything in your life unless he secures your agreement. I mean, it's not like you're all of a sudden going to walk by an occult bookstore and end up like this. That's not going to happen. Any more than you're going to walk by a tattoo parlor and suddenly come away with a tattoo. No, you're going to have to go inside. Agreement's going to have to be made. Something's going to have to happen. And that's the same way it works in the world of the Spirit. And, and the, you know what? God works the same way. Now, it's a little bit different because God prefers not to do anything in our life without our agreement. It's not that he can't because he is God. And I mean, we have instances in the scripture where he certainly did things in people's lives where they didn't agree to that, right? But it was for the furtherance of his plan. But if you look at it back in the beginning, why do you think he made us in his image with the ability to communicate with him, both hearing and speaking with him? It's because he wanted to work together with us in partnership. And we know from our own lives that God can only do as much as we let him do. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, I mean, we can have as much of the Lord as we want, right? But it's only as we continue to agree with him that agreement is called repentance because in order to take something from the Lord, that means we got to let go of something else, right? And so as long as we continue in that process, God can continue to work for us. But the good news here that I want you to get out of what we're, we're talking about is the fact that the enemy cannot, he cannot do anything in, in our life unless we secure his agreement. So at some point, this individual, through one decision, began the process of agreeing with the enemy. And each decision that he made led to another decision. And every decision that he made was a further step of submission to the voice suggesting the course of action. So it started out with one suggestion. He may have toyed with that thought for a while. He may have thought, well, maybe I shouldn't do that. Or, but, you know, it might be good if I did. And back and forth until finally he gave in. The voice suggested, he finally agreed. The next time the voice came around, said, hey, why don't you do that again? Well, you know, that wasn't so bad the first time. So now we do it again, and it's easier the second time. And then the third time, it's easier still. And then the fourth time, it's even easier. Pretty soon, when the fifth time rolls around, there's hardly a thought. And it just goes on until something tragic begins to unfold because Jesus made the statement over in John chapter 8, verse 34. He said, everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. Now, you notice he did not say everyone who sins is a slave of sin because that would be all of us then. But everyone who practices sin, who continually, repeatedly engages himself in a sinful activity is going to become the slave of sin, and repeated agreement and submission eventually led to a hostile takeover of this man's entire personality and life. It didn't happen all at once. It started with a decision, and each decision leading to another until finally he lost control. It got beyond what he could do with it. Now, all of a sudden, it's not asking for his agreement. He has submitted to the point that now it is literally in total control. So now, by this point, he is spiritually under the influence of a being that cares nothing for him and is totally bent on his destruction. Never make this mistake of thinking that there is any love in the dark world because there's not. The devil does not care about you or I, either one. The only reason he takes any interest in any of us is because he cannot get to God. So because he cannot get to God, he will 
pick on you and me because we're made in God's image. And so now this person is completely under the influence of something that does not care for him, regardless what it told him, is completely bent on his destruction. And now by this point, he has completely lost all control of his mind, his will, and his emotions. Everything is out of whack. Everything is being controlled like a puppet on a string by some other force. And socially now... He is completely cut off from all that he had once known and loved. I mean, the Bible, unfortunately, doesn't tell us a whole lot about this individual. For all we know, maybe he was a married man with kids. But now, because he has come into agreement with this dark power, he's living out in the tombs and running around with no clothes on and screaming and cutting himself and just completely out of control. Well, nobody's going to have anything to do with that. So he's now completely isolated, totally under the control of this thing that's gotten control of him and is not about to let go. And you know, people actually tried to help him. We read that in the scripture. Now, of course, we got to think of the steps that people take to help one another, right? And so I'm going to modernize this just a little bit, but it's true. You know, when people try to help, many times the first thing they do is educate them. Well, you know, he just needs a little education. He just needs to be told why this is not a good idea to run around with no clothes on and screaming. So maybe he, they took him to some kind of class and said, you know, now we, we, we want to help you make better decisions. And you know what? He might have said in the class and he might have agreed with what they were saying, but because this thing had such a grip on him, it didn't make any difference. He walked right out of that class and continued on with his aberrant behavior because he wasn't in control. So if education doesn't work, the next thing we go to is legislation. Now we're going to make it illegal. So now you can't run around to do that. So in these days, the city elders would have met at the gate of the city and passed a law that it was illegal to run around without clothes on and screaming, right? So somebody would have made a motion, everybody voted, yep, now it's law. Now they take that law and they go to him and say, Charlie, it is no longer legal for you to run around like that, so you need to stop it. Folks, we can't even get people to stop at a stop sign. I mean, how much good is that going to do? Right? You know, they could have passed all the laws. (laughs) If passing laws would make a difference, we would have stopped the drug trade a long time ago. Human trafficking wouldn't even be a thing. Legislation does nothing other than give us legal grounds for incarcerating those who break the laws. That's the only thing legalities do. They do not stop sin. Because it's not legislation, it's transformation that makes the difference. And that leads into my next point. If legislation doesn't work, the next thing we go to is incarceration. Right? Incarceration takes a person out of circulation without really dealing with the problem. And they did try to incarcerate him. They tried to tie him up. That didn't work. He broke the ropes. They tried putting shackles on him. Uh, that, that would have been metal manacles on his hands and feet. That didn't work. He broke those because he was operating in a power that was superior to all of those things. So no matter what they tried to do, nothing worked. Now, in modern times, another thing that we try is medication. That would be a very modern thing. I mean, can you imagine the kind of meds he would have been on if it had been in our world? But even medication only goes so far. That will, you know, may suppress a person's behavior, but it doesn't set them free. And please don't hear that I am against medication because I'm not. I've seen medication help lots of people, and that's good. But in this particular case, that would not have been an answer because his problem was not physical and it wasn't mental. It was spiritual. And those are things that all of these other things cannot touch. So when all of this fails they finally end up at the very last place, which is resignation. And resignation is where they just throw their hands up and say, we don't know what to do. We've tried talking to him. That didn't work. We tried passing laws. That didn't work. We tried tying him up. That didn't work. 
So I guess as long as he stays out there in the tombs and doesn't come into town and bother anybody, I guess that's just the way it's going to be. And so they just completely gave up. I mean, what were they going to do? They didn't have any answers. And you have to understand something here. This is in the region of the Gerasenes. This was not Jewish territory. This was Gentile territory. They didn't have the living God. They had foreign gods. Who knows? Maybe it was through the worship of these foreign gods that he got into this situation. We don't know. But they had no access. They had nothing in their arsenal with which to deal with this situation. But then one day, something happened. And as our sister read for us just a moment ago, Jesus landed on the beach. Having come through this horrendous storm, and the Sea of Galilee is noted for that. You know, the Sea of Galilee lies down at the end of the Jordanian Valley, and it's known for winds coming, whipping down through there all of a sudden, and it can be just as calm as glass one moment, and the next thing you know, that sea is just a raging cauldron of, of waves and wind and everything else. And so they just come through that, and I mean, think about the disciples just a moment. I mean, they were probably just a little freaked out, you know, because, I mean, first one minute they think they're going to drown. The next moment Jesus is standing up going, hush, and everything calms down. And they're wondering, what are we dealing with here? And now all of a sudden they come to the beach, and what do they see? Naked and screaming. I can just picture Tom and heading back to the boat going, I did not sign up for this. This is not what I wanted, you know. I mean, you got to have some pity for these guys, seriously. Jesus was completely unruffled. It didn't bother him at all. <laughs> but immediately, here this man comes. Jesus knew who was in charge. And then we read here in verses 6 to 8. It says, When he, this man, saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And then he cried out with a loud voice, Leave me alone, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. I implore you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. Isn't it interesting, and you see this frequently through the Gospels, that even though the Jewish people by and large did not recognize who Jesus was, the demons always did. And I mean, here is this guy, I mean, completely out of his mind, you know, being demonized. And he comes running to Jesus the first thing he does is he falls down, he bows down before him, which is the response of a subordinate to a superior. In other words, they totally recognize Jesus' authority. He recognized who Jesus was, Son of the Most High God. They knew exactly who he was. And they also knew that their fate was in his hands. Whatever he said they were going to have to do, and they were scared to death that he was going to torment them. So they recognized that he had the ability. You know, it's interesting. We don't have any record of him doing this with anybody else. He didn't fear their legislation. He didn't fear their incarceration. He didn't fear anything any of his townspeople did. But the minute this man showed up, these demons were scared to death. They knew who he was, and they knew full on <laughs> who, what he could do. And so, of course, we know the story here, and I'm not going to take the time to, to read all of this to you, but we know the story that all of a sudden they, they looked up, and here was this big herd of pigs off in the distance, and they said, send us over there. You know, let, let us go over there. They didn't want to leave the region for whatever reason. And so finally Jesus said, Go. And so they went into this herd of pigs, and this whole herd of pigs runs down into the sea and is drowned. Think about if you were one of the herdsmen. All of a sudden, you've completely lost control of the herd. And no matter what you do, you're yelling and screaming at them, they're all just running down into the drink, and now they're all, <laughs> bloop, bloop, you know, it's all over with. Done. All right? I think you'd take off and run back to town as well. <laughs> you got to come see this. I didn't even ever see anything like this. But I want you to note the contrast. These demons had completely destroyed this man's life. 
totally. Everything about him was ruined. And isn't it interesting that the minute they entered those pigs, they completely destroyed the pigs? Killed them all. And that's because demons destroy everything they touch. Everything they touch. Sometimes we think it's really cool, you know. Oh, kind of cool to meet a demon. It's not. I've met a few of them, and it's not. There's nothing cool about it. I've seen what they do to people, and it's not pretty. And as we see it in the Scripture here, it's not pretty. But Jesus, on the other hand, through just one encounter, totally restores the man's life. Look at verses 14 and 15 here. Uh, if I can find it. Mm. It says, now the herdsmen ran off and spread the news in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what in the world had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they saw the demon-possessed man sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind, the one who had the legion, and they were afraid. So here was the demons. They completely destroyed this man's life through a process of interaction that he had had with them, but through one simple encounter, Jesus completely set this man free, completely restored his mental faculties, completely restored his social standing, and gave him a new lease on life. One encounter. All the efforts of everybody else did nothing but one encounter with Jesus Christ changed everything. And anybody who's ever met Jesus Christ has had that same experience. July the 24th of this year, it was 49 years ago that I met Jesus Christ in the living room of my home in Hugoton, Kansas. I was 15 years old, so you can do the math. And I'll tell you what, the lightning didn't flash and the thunder didn't roll, but something happened to me. All I know is I was one way one minute and I was totally different the next. One encounter. One encounter with the living Christ changed the trajectory of my life forever. I was losing my mind because I knew I wasn't right with God, but I'd already done everything my church had told me to do, and now I had messed everything up, and I didn't know how to fix it. But Jesus did. And through one encounter, my whole life turned around. And 49 years later, Vern, it's better than it's ever been. I can't wait to see what the next 49 holds. Why not? A man who is completely hopeless and beyond all help from his peers was completely set free and restored through just one encounter with the king. You know what that means? That means that we should have a lot of hope. Because it doesn't matter how complex your problem is. Maybe you're already born again. Maybe you've met Jesus Christ in that encounter. That's wonderful. But life goes on and we still have our problems. It doesn't matter how complex your problem is. It doesn't matter how tough the situation you're dealing with is. Through one encounter with the king, that whole thing can begin to unravel and turn completely around. All we have to do is the same thing that this man does. did. We need to come to Jesus, bow down before him, recognizing that he has the power to change everything. Hand it over to him and watch him work. 
Now, I'm not saying it's all going to turn around instantaneously. Some things will work themselves out in the process of time. Some things, however, will turn around just like that. And it's wonderful when it does. But the same Jesus is just as alive today as he was on the shores of Gennesaret. And he's got just as much power and just as much authority as what he ever had. All we have to do is have the faith to run and bow down to him and say, help me. I don't know what to do. And that's when he smiles and says, watch this. <laughs> Father God, we are so grateful. So grateful that we serve a living Christ. So grateful that the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is still the Jesus of today. And so, Lord, I pray that every one of us, no matter what we're facing, no matter what's going on in our lives, would have the sense that this man had to run and bow to Jesus, trusting that he is still the all-powerful Christ, to hand over our troubles and our trials to him and see him turn them all around for his glory and the advance of his kingdom. May you move in the lives of your people, O oh God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.